Sandra Thompson Herman joins other women in recognizing Judy Woodruff for her long and legendary career, a shining example for all. For more than five decades, she has been a trusted voice. Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff on the NewsHour tonight. Judy Woodruff has covered the White House, interviewed presidents and world leaders, and brought the issues of our time into focus as one of Washington's most respected journalists. But after 50 years, she decided it was time for something new. After a decade as anchor of this extraordinary program, I've decided that the end of 2022 is the right time to turn this incredibly important job over to someone else. Just a few days later, she was in New Orleans to speak at the annual luncheon of the Bureau of Governmental Research. Woodruff talked about her favorite topic, politics, as well as the new assignment that she'll take on when she leaves the nightly anchor desk. And I had the chance to sit down with her for an in-depth discussion about politics, the media, and her career. She is Judy Woodruff, Woman of the Hour. Judy Woodruff, welcome to New Orleans. It's so good to have you here, and thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. It's such an honor to be here and to have a chance to talk to you. This is, <laughs> Thank this is you a so treat much. for me. I am really honored to talk to you. You have been a role model for so many women in broadcast journalism. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. So you are about to make a change in your very storied career. You're going to go back into the field and, and mm -hmm. talk to Americans at this real important time in our history. I do want to find out more about that from you. But you're going to be back in field reporting, and that's kind of where you started. And mm -hmm. that's what I'd kind of like to start our conversation with is where you started um, and why. Why did you want to move into broadcast journalism? Well, it's a little bit of a convoluted story, and I'll try to condense it. But I grew up um, uh, an Army brat family. Uh, my father was in the, in the Army. He was in World War II. I was born after World War to um, when I was five years old, um, I left Tulsa, where I was born, to go to Germany, where we lived for three years, our family. It was parents and me. Came back to the United States, lived in Missouri at a military base, then New Jersey, then uh, back in Tulsa briefly before we went to Taiwan for a few years. By the time I ended up, uh, my father assigned to a military base in Georgia, in Augusta, uh, near Augusta. Uh, I was in seventh grade. It was the seventh school I had been to in seven years. So I was used to bouncing around a lot. And, um, and we ended up staying in Augusta after that. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. She never was able to finish high school. Uh, but she always said to me, you're going to get an education. You're going to have that ability to, to do what you want to do. And she really, you know, drummed that into my mind that no matter what, you know, her limitations had been, she, she wanted me and my sister, who came along later, to have those opportunities. And so I always knew I was going to get an education, but what I was going to do with it was another question. And it was a bit of a circuitous road. I, I had teachers who said, you know, you're good at math. You ought to study, you know, major in math in college. So I, I went to to college majoring in math, of all things, but I didn't know what kind of work that was going to lead to. I happened to have a, a great professor my first year as a freshman who was a political science uh, instructor, and she got me very excited about politics, government. At the same time, the male uh, calculus uh, instructor basically treated the women in my class as if we were in the wrong classroom and that we didn't have any business studying advanced math. So that I took to heart. I changed my major to political science, transferred it when it was at a small women's college, Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, transferred to Duke, thinking I would work in government. I got a job for two summers in a row as a college intern working for my congressman from Georgia. The second summer I was in Washington, the women I met on Capitol Hill said, you don't want to come to Washington after you graduate because you'll just be a gopher. You'll be the coffee girl. So it sounds familiar to a lot of women who were of my generation. So I went back to Duke my senior year, talked to my professors. I said, what am I going to do? And one of them said, you know, do you ever think about covering politics? And so that's what I did. I immediately made a pivot. I thought, OK, maybe I can get a job working in television, because I didn't have a lot of clips. You know, to get a job at a newspaper, you've got to show them what you've already written. I didn't have that. So I thought, I'll start out. I'll, I'll empty the trash. I'll. And so I became the coffee girl, the thing that I said I wasn't going to do 
um, in politics, I became the coffee girl, newsroom secretary in Atlanta, working uh, at a station um, that needed a secretary, somebody to answer the phone and clean the film, and that was my job. So what a beginning. Huh? You were bound <laughs> and determined, though, to go beyond that, beyond the coffee girl. And so it brought you into becoming finally a reporter. You became a reporter in local news, and you were breaking into this at a time when really there weren't many women at all at any level covering politics. You wanted to cover politics, and you were bound and determined to do it, and you did. The first news director where I was working as a secretary, when I would say to him, I want to learn from the reporters and the crews here, he said, why would you want to do that? We already have a woman reporter. And it was true. Each station in Atlanta then had one woman. And this is a big city in the South. A uh, one-woman reporter. But that was about to change. And so I really got in kind of at the at the, at the cusp of when things were changing. Um, and I was a beneficiary of the fact that, I mean, Richard Nixon, as president, put uh, pressure on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to, um, if, uh, to tell, essentially, the broadcast networks that they had to put more women in places of, of prominence and on the air. And so now women are just in the field in a major, major way now. Women are leaders in media. Absolutely. Women are covering wars. In fact, most of the correspondents we turn to at the news hour, many of them are women who are going into the, the, the most dangerous places uh, on the planet. They're reporting from during the Iraq War, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, right now, we've had a woman reporter, Jane Ferguson, uh, reporting for us. She's a special correspondent for the news hour. She's been in and out of Ukraine. She's been in Yemen. I mean, these are places you don't, uh, for, not for the faint of heart. And so women are war correspondents. They're now covering the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, certainly. I mean, going back to, to my days covering the White House in the 1970s. It's taken a long time, but we've made progress. But we still have a way to go. I mean, we still we need more women in print media um, as general managers, as edit, chief editors, and not just women. If I may say, we need people of color, people with diverse backgrounds, different faith backgrounds, because we need to look like the country. And a lot of newsrooms don't look like America, frankly. Now, going back to your pioneering days and your earlier days as a, a broadcast journalist and when you were reporting in Atlanta, you got to know the Jimmy Carter camp pretty well. And that really did work to your benefit. You went on to NBC um, and then ultimately, like you said, you were the White House reporter. I read your book. Uh, that was published in 1982. This is Judy Woodruff from the White House. And what really struck me a lot of it throughout the book really did strike me. But in the beginning, you really give a compelling story of being there when Ronald Reagan, uh, the, the assassination attempt uh, on Ronald Reagan. I mean, you were steps away. You were the pool reporter. It just a really very riveting. I mean, you know, you just are on edge reading your account of it. But what also struck me was you had to run around to find a telephone mm -hmm. to phone this in. Such a different time, a different day and age. And you have been through all of these changes of technology. What has it done, this change in technology, to news reporting, to news gathering, to news distribution? Yeah, there's probably no greater reminder to me of how far we've come than you're right, that day at the end of March in 1981 when uh, President Reagan had someone try to kill him. Um, and there were, there were no cell phones, and so I went running to a, a payphone uh, to find a payphone. They were all gone in the Hilton Hotel. They were all, there were only two or three. They were, somebody was there. I had to run across the street and go into a building I'd never noticed before and beg them to let me use the phone, and thankfully they did. But you're absolutely right, Marcy. I mean, we have been through enormous change technologically. We, I mean, when I started out, we were using film, and I would run back from the state capitol to the station in Atlanta and wait for the film to go through the processor. We called it the soup. It took 40 minutes to, to, to process the film, then we could get, run it to the edit m machine and get it on and get it on the air by 6 o'clock, all the way to after I started with NBC in the mid-'70s. Um, we were using videotape. It was being introduced at that time. And then, of course, fast forward decades and videotape, the cameras got smaller and smaller and now everything today is digital and it's instantaneous. And 
it's meant that we are able to cover almost anything now. We can get news from around the world. People, reporters can pick up their iPhone or their other device and report from where they are, and it instantly is sent back to the United States or London or wherever they're reporting to. Um, it's, it's, it's meant instantaneous, but what it's also done is it's required that reporters are always on deadline. You go to cover a place like this, and if you, if you work for the AP, or you work for another news organization that has constant deadlines, and frankly, with Twitter and some of the other platforms that we're working with today, people are competing to see who can be the first one on AP, Twitter, wherever it is, mm -hmm. to get the news out. And so the consumer, in one sense, is better off because we have more information, we have it instantly. On the other hand, reporters have less time to think about what they're doing. So. I celebrate the advances in technology, but I do worry about how reporters have less time to think, to reflect before they report. And I think so many of them are very smart, in some cases brilliant, and they're able to juggle all these different um, uh, assignments that they have, multiple assignments that just never end. But I also know from talking to them, and in my own case, you know, should you really be tweeting when something's just happened, when you're still understanding what it means. And so all the more important that reporters not just timestamp what they're doing, but they also make it clear that they're reporting a story in progress, that this story is still evolving, that there's more to come. Because we can so often, we do, jump to conclusions, we jump on the bandwagon, this is what happened, this is what it means, when actually there's more information to come. You know, you have the reputation of really being a straightforward reporter. You're credible. We can really believe what you are telling us. I know in your 1982 book, you said you wanted to be credible and authoritative. That That's a banner that you have carried, and you wear it well, and, you know, thank you for it, definitely. Um, because in this age of immediacy, there's a lot of misinformation that goes out there. So journalists really do have a responsibility, don't they? Journalists have a responsibility, for sure, and so do consumers. Mm -hmm. I mean, today, I think it's harder. I mentioned how hard it is to be a reporter. It's hard to be a news consumer these days because you have, depending on where you get your news and information from, you may not always know that what you're seeing is accurate. I mean, a lot of people now go to Facebook, and they read news stories that their cousin sent them or their next-door neighbor or their friend from college. And sometimes those stories are real and accurate and vetted and confirmed, and sometimes they're not. And sometimes they're completely made up, and they're a deliberate disinformation, not just wrong, but deliberately wrong and meant to spread uh, falsehoods. And we have a lot of that going on in our country right now, and not just from people talking about overseas actors doing that, overseas governments uh, from you know the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, and so on, and I could go down the list, countries that have an interest or or political groups that have an interest. But in our country, I mean, we've seen the parties go at it, and we've seen people uh, and organizations make stuff up in order to advance a cause or a case or a candidate. I say just make sure you look at the source. The source is what matters so much. And people have to do that now, and reporters have to be careful, because we are gathering research, we're gathering information, and we've got to check it out and make sure it's correct before we put it out on the air or publish it. At PBS, you have been most recently the sole anchor for PBS NewsHour, and before that, you, you shared the anchor desk with the great Gwen Eiffel. Tell us a little bit about her. An extraordinary woman, an extraordinary journalist, just a, a, an iconic figure in American journalism and a pioneer. I mean, Gwen was the daughter of a, a Methodist minister, traveled a lot as she was growing up, and faced terrible discrimination early in her career. Um, she, her first job, I think it was with the Boston Herald, she showed up and somebody had put a very ugly note on her, on her desk, telling her to go away. Um, but she persevered. I mean, Gwen, you know, not only the, one of the biggest hearts of anybody I've ever known, but the kind of courage to just march on. And Gwen, again, the closest, one of the closest people I can think of to a true North 
in our business because she just focused on what mattered. She had this unerring ability to look at a story. She covered a lot of politics. That was her great interest. Um, she could look at what was going on and just go right to the to the center of it and focus on that. And you saw that in her interviews. You saw it in her reporting. She was just uh, an extraordinary person. And you two were pioneers together. You were the first two women anchors, That's as right. I understand. First two women to anchor an evening, a national, national evening, mm -hmm. evening newscast. And that's, of course, with PBS, PBS NewsHour. PBS is looked at by news consumers as being really the most credible source. I mean, this is proven in surveys all the time. It seems like it was important for you to be with a news operation like that and also a news operation that would give you time. That's right. That to go was in my. Depth. That was what originally interested me in PBS. I had been at NBC for now over nine years and was cover, had covered the White House for six years, was then doing interviews out of Washington for the Today Show. So I had a very good job at NBC, um, but I knew that my friend, Jim Lehrer, and, and Robert McNeil, whom I didn't know at the time, were expanding from a half-hour report to news hour. And I also knew, happened to know the president, their, their newly hired executive producer had been the president of NBC, Les Crystal, so I knew him. But what intrigued me was the fact that they had a whole hour. That I, This was back early 1980s when all three commercial uh, television news organizations, news divisions, were saying, we want to go to an hour, we want to go to an hour, but their affiliates ABC, CBS, NBC were saying, we're not ready to give up that additional half hour real estate. Somehow Jim and Robin persuaded the PBS universe to give up some real estate, another half hour of real estate to them, which is not an insignificant thing. And so in September of 1983, they launched the news hour and I had gone to work for them that summer as their chief Washington correspondent. And it, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I mean, it was just a fabulous opportunity to go out and do reporting, to do longer interviews. And the program was all about, not just in depth, but um, asking the tough questions, the, 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 the questions that, frankly, ordinary viewers would have. But time, and time matters in television. I mean, you can't, you, it's not just obvious that you get to share more information. But sometimes stories require that. You know, 60 seconds is not enough, or a minute and a half is not enough. Now, over time, I will tell you, here we are in 2022, uh, 40 years, is that right? Mm -hmm. After almost 40 years after mm -hmm. I started at the News Hour. Our segments are shorter and, and more fast paced, and that's because the American people have shorter attention spans. They've gotten used to getting their news in, you know, quick, quicker. And, but we still haven't given up the seriousness of purpose. Yes, we've gone from maybe a 15 or 20 minute segment down to a five, six, seven, eight minute segment. Big interviews we'll give 12 minutes to. I interviewed uh, Liz Cheney mm -hmm. uh, not, not long ago. And uh, we ended up, I think, giving that 15 minutes, maybe 17 minutes on the news hour that night because it's significant. It was an opportunity to talk to someone of consequence. That's what the news hour is all about. In all of the years now that you have been in broadcast news and all the coverage, all the people that you've talked to, just the general public, to the policymakers, to world leaders, we are now in a situation, certainly in this nation, of real division. Um, tell me your thoughts and feelings about what this country is going through and what you've seen, how you've seen it develop. Well, I've been a reporter for 52 years, since I started in 1970 working for the CBS affiliate in Atlanta. And I've seen a lot of political disagreements. I've covered Democrats, covered Republicans, I've covered independents. But I've never seen the country as divided as it is right now, and it has been for the last few years. It breaks my heart. I, I, uh, not, I, I never would expect America would be kumbaya, we're all gonna hold hands and agree. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm referring to the ability to have a different opinion, but still respect the other person in the conversation or the other political party, and understand that each party has a role in our system of government. But what's happened is that the divisions have grown so deep and they've grown 
angry, and they've grown to the point where one side accuses the other of not being good Americans, of being unpatriotic, of, being, uh, of having uh, ulterior motives, of not wanting the best for the country. Um, and that's taking it to down a few levels mm -hmm. to the point that it's not healthy for our country. I mean, I think disagreement is healthy. Democracy is about having these open debates. And thank God we can have those debates. Thank God we can, we can have these conversations in our country and disagree. And you can stand up and criticize a president or a governor or a mayor, and you're not going to get thrown in jail for it or worse, which is happening in too many parts of the world. Thank God we, we are able to do that. Having said that, some people are now getting so angry, they are taking steps in the direction of violence. We saw that not long ago with the attack on the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, and there's countless, frankly, unfortunately, other examples of that. We don't want to go in that direction. I think we've got to pull back. I feel so strongly about it that um, there's a way, there has to be a way to, to keep up the tradition of, yes, we can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable about it. We can still respect the other. So that's why I'm launching this project. What I want to do is I thought about the moment was coming for me to step back from the anchor desk. I thought, what is it that, that I feel most curious about and most interested in and frankly, I'm most worried about? And that is the division that we are seeing and witnessing and living in in our country right now, where family members can't even have a conversation over the dinner table, neighbors putting up walls, um, and candidates you know, screaming at each other or about each other, all the negative advertising, which I know has become part of the landscape of American politics, unfortunately. But it's just gotten angrier and angrier. We've got to reflect on it. So what I decided I wanted to do was spend the next two years leading into the next presidential election at the end of 2024 looking at asking the American people themselves. I want to travel around the country, ask them, you know, why do you think we're so divided? What do you care about? What do you, is government at the federal level in Washington giving you what you think we should have as American people? Um, what do you expect of government? And, and, and is it realistic? Um, but, but, but primarily trying to understand why we don't respect the other point of view anymore. Um, clearly, some of our political leaders have played a role in this, former President Trump, others who have been very, very outspoken in, their, in the way they talk about people who disagree with them. Um, that's part of it. But I think it, it, some, the roots of some of this go back farther than that, even back, I think, of the early 1990s. Um, so that's one of the things I want to look at, is where did it come from? What did, what did the American people think of it and what do they think we can do to get out of it, to get through it. I think solutions, possible solutions, have to be part of these conversations. And by the way, Marcial, I will also talk to experts, to people who are sociologists, mm -hmm. uh, political scientists who've studied this, written about it, journalists, um, people who are experts in education and science and all that, who are now trying to understand why people don't agree on the facts of science or how we educate our children. We now have huge fights in the country over these things that, that um, used to be kind of something we had a consensus on. And you're going to go out there into America to find out uh, what people think about democracy. And so tell us, how are we going to see this now in PBS? Will this be regular stories or a special project or what? Yes, I aim to do regular segments on the news hour. We're going to start out probably once every two weeks. Hopefully by February 2023, uh, we'll see if we can get get our work started that quickly. Uh, start out probably every other week, but then but then eventually move to once a week, doing a report on uh, what the American people think, hearing from people all across the country, in the middle, the south, the northwest, and from one end of the country to the other, hearing from people what some people in Washington talk about flyover America frankly, the heart of the country that doesn't get heard from enough. Those are the folks I want to hear from. And then, and then also uh, conversations with people who have studied this division and who thought a lot and written a lot about why we are so politically divided right now and what are some solutions for getting through this. 
I hope to come away from this understanding a little bit better at the end of these two years uh, what the American people want and, and uh, what they think about our democracy and the future of our democracy. And to wrap up, just getting to you personally in this wonderful career that you've had, some reflections on it. What has it meant to you? What have you learned? What do you feel about having this opportunity that you have had now for all these years? You are looking at one grateful girl. I am overflowing with thanks and gratitude at the career I've been able to have, the life I've been able to have. I mean, coming up as the daughter of a of a chief warrant officer in the United States Army and a homemaking mother who basically had to leave school at the age of 14 in order to take care of her siblings uh, after her father died, never was able to finish high school. I just, I'm overflowing with gratitude and um, neither of my parents is alive any longer, but um, I think about um, what opportunities there are in the United States that people in so many other parts of the world, even today, still don't have those opportunities, or they are very rare. Um, the fact that it could happen to me I, tells me that it can happen to so many other Americans, and, and certainly going into the future. I want my story to be the story of today's young people who are coming along, whether they want to go into journalism or science or teaching or the law or the military or government, politics. I want them to know that they can have the same opportunity, that this is a country of opportunity. It's not a country where we shut people out. Um, I'm, just, I'm just one grateful woman, girl. <laughs> and we are grateful that you have been here all these years to, to report to us, because we could definitely count on what you're saying. And we look forward to what you're going to continue to report to us over a real important time in our history. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra Thompson Herman joins other women in recognizing Judy Woodruff for her long and legendary career, a shining example for all.